Welcome to The Policy Shop, weekly conversations with public policy experts where we'll dive into the most important issues affecting all of us here in Illinois. I'm Hillary Gowans. Let's get started. Joining me today is Miley Smith, Staff Attorney and Director of Labor Policy at the Illinois Policy Institute. Conveniently for us, she's also an expert on constitutional law, and we've needed one of those over the past few weeks as chaos has ensued in regard to the governor's mask mandates and what's next. So we'll dive into that today. Miley, thanks so much for joining me. Of course, I'm always glad to be here. You've been on my speed dial for a long time now because I've needed someone to help me decipher what is going on. So let's set the stage here. Um, A couple of weeks ago, a downstate judge issued a temporary restraining order that threw Governor Pritzker's school mask mandate into absolute disarray. Start with that, explain what happened, and then let's move along the timeline, if that's okay with you. So I think, you know, basically we need to just first cover, there are three levels of of courts in Illinois and in most states. And so this was the lowest level. This was the first level, the trial court. And what the judge did was issue a temporary restraining order against the mask mandate, as well as some of his other emergency rules. And what a temporary restraining order is, is like a a stay just it's it's a temp it's temporary and it just puts on hold the government action until after the case is decided so the goal is to preserve whatever was the status quo before the government action so in this case that status quo was no masks on kids um, without due process of law and so it was a temporary restraining order until there was a decision on the merits of the case. And that is what threw the state, the school districts into disarray, figuring out what they should do in light of the fact that the governor is telling them you must mandate and the court is telling them that his executive orders cannot be enforced. So then we got even more news when earlier this week, and for anyone listening, I should note that we're talking on Friday, February 18th because of time constraints here with the holiday weekend. So anyway, earlier this week, the week of February 18th, uh, actually yesterday on February 17th, uh, we got a ruling from the appellate court on that temporary restraining order. Tell us what happened and where things stand now with the mandates. And this is where things get even quirkier in a way, because we got to back up just a little bit in between when the TRO was issued by the the lower court and the decision by the appellate court, there was an action by a state legislative committee um, called JCARP. And that committee stepped in, the governor had tried to reissue his rules and that committee said, no, wait, We are not going to approve this until after the appeal in the case. So basically what it came down to was they didn't want to reissue a rule that had been put on hold by a court because that would seem to be a waste of time and energy for people. And so what happened then was those rules were no longer on the books, so to speak. So then enters the appellate court and the appellate court says, well, because the rules aren't even on the books anymore, this case is moot. That means that it doesn't have to be decided. The issue, the underlying issue of the mandates went away because the rules were no longer in place enforcing the mandate. So that was the decision of the appellate court. They did not decide if that temporary restraining order was appropriate. They didn't decide if the governor has these powers to put kids in masks in schools, whether his departments like the um, Board of Health, the State Department of Health have that kind of power. All they said was, we're not deciding this because the underlying rules are no longer in place and the case is moot. So then they, then it goes back to the district court at that point. So the lower court, the appellate court have both rejected what Prisker wants. Right. The legislative body has rejected his proposal to renew the emergency rules that we just talked about. And I should note too that that legislative body is is made up of Republicans and Democrats. So it was a bipartisan push 
Um, so why did he appeal? Why did Pritzker appeal to the Illinois Supreme Court? Why not admit defeat? I think this is all about preserving what he believes is the power of the governor. And what I think most people across the state think has gone too far, that one man shouldn't have the unilateral right two years into a pandemic to keep making decisions without the input of the General Assembly. And that's actually a point that the lower court judge made, that these executive orders are stepping over the line even into where the, the judiciary, where the courts should be determining different issues. So I think this is about potentially his reelection and preserving powers that he would like to have down the line. You, you used that word power a couple of times. Um, in recent weeks, we've seen a lot of other states ending mandates. We've seen a lot of states ending these emergency powers that their governors had been exercising. Our neighbor, Iowa, um, Governor Reynolds just said, look, this is no longer appropriate for me to be holding this much power and authority. Uh, and, and the states are moving on back to this structure where the laws are written by the elected officials in the, in the legislature. And it's, it's a, a good moment to pause and reflect on how our government is supposed to work. Right. Talk about how that has been distorted over the past two years. Well, what we have seen from Governor Pritzker over the last two years is over 100 executive orders, whether that be in regard to masks or closing businesses or vaccinating teachers or acquiring testing, there've been over a hundred executive orders. In the meantime, the General Assembly has not stepped in at all in any of those issues. And so we have, you know, we, we learned about this, what in like eighth grade civics class that there's three co-equal branches of government. But in Illinois right now, we have one branch, the executive who is basically unilaterally declaring what amount to laws. Schools have to follow them. Private schools have to follow them. They have removed recognition from schools if they don't follow these. So that's basically making a law that has to be followed. That's the legislature's job. And when we're this far, we're two years in, um, it, it becomes suspect whether or not those emergency issues are still really emergency issues or whether the General Assembly should be the one stepping in and now determining how our schools should work, what are those roles that um, should be taken over by them as opposed to what the, the governor has been doing all by himself. Yeah, and this, this conversation for me has become a lot less about masks, which is I think what a lot of people are focusing on and I, I frankly don't care where people fall on masks. You know, if you think that they do help prevent the spread and transmission of COVID, or if you don't think they help at all, you can find studies that say whatever you want. To me, the most important issue is, well, why, why are we just okay with totally usurping the way things are supposed to work? And you made a good point uh, a little bit ago when we were talking um, about how people on the other side of the mask issue from, you know, there are people right now who are I, saying, I want mask optional in my school. And so they're happy with what has happened with the appellate court. Now, the people who, who want masks required in school still for everybody, they're probably not as happy with what's happening. Um, but I think it would be interesting to ask them if they would be happy if we had a Republican governor, for example, who was was doing the opposite. I mean, you, you can you give us a scenario for what this might look like in a different situation if someone else were to continue exercising executive authority for as long as J.B. Pritzker has? Sure. I think a, a great example is something that the lower court judge said in her TRO order, she acknowledged that the state had argued the governor has unlimited authority to do whatever is necessary. That is a striking claim that, that the governor through the states, you know, through his attorney is claiming that they have the power to do whatever is necessary. Um, so exact, you know, exactly what you said, imagine that in a different scenario, 
that they have the power to do whatever is necessary. You know, Governor Rauner um, was very much disliked by Democrats in the state. Imagine if Governor Rauner had said that he had the authority to do whatever was necessary. Um, or we could have a governor after Governor Prisker and he or she could say, I have the authority to do whatever is necessary. That's a very dangerous argument. Um, and I think that looking at this, that there've been over a hundred executive orders on COVID demonstrates that there needs to be some check in place to keep that from happening again, so that a governor doesn't think that they have the power to do whatever is necessary. It doesn't have to be in a pandemic. I mean, emergencies get um, called for various things, whether it's, it can be weather related, it can be um, for, for various other issues. And if we have a governor thinking that he or she can just execute an order whenever it's necessary, that's a dangerous position for our state to be in. Let's talk about, um what's going on uh, in schools right now, and then what's next. So uh, we've, we saw something from the plaintiff's attorney saying that over 550 school districts have gone mask optional. Now we have 850 some school districts. So that's a significant portion of right. Illinois majority. school districts. Yes. Right. right. Um, so on the one hand, you've got Pritzker saying that the mandates are still in place which the courts and the, the legislative body has said, no, that's not right. On the other hand, you've got these schools operating under local guidance now. Um, and then you've got this appeal by the governor to the, Supreme, the state Supreme Court. So what in the world happens next? Well, I think this is, it demonstrates why this should be local control right? We are two years in. I know I keep saying that, but I don't want to lose that context. We're not talking about March of 2020. We're talking about, we're coming up on March of 2022. And schools need to be able to have the ability to know it, at this minute what they can and can't do. And the executive orders have made that unclear. Um, obviously, the case has made that unclear. And, and what we need is clear direction for the courts, or I'm sorry, for the schools and what we really need to see is the General Assembly acting and passing a law like other states have done, limiting that executive power so that we don't see this happen again. And I know that we're in the preliminary stages of it really examining what other states have done or what they have on the books already. What are some of the safeguards that other states have put in place to ensure that there's not this disruption of the way government's supposed to operate? So I think something that surprised people early on, you know, when when the pandemic started was there were 30 day emergency orders. Right. So I think it surprised people that the governor could just issue another one for 30 days and another one for 30 days and another one for 30 days. And there there is no limit in law on that saying he can't do that explicitly. But other states have put a check in place with their legislatures to make sure that there can't just be never ending orders put in place. So some states have required after that expires for the legislature to take an, an action, an affirmative action to keep it in place. Um, other states have done something similar um, where the order might be, the emergency order might be in place, but the, the um, legislature can come in and say, okay, now it's done. So it, you know, it really does enforce what we know in democracy as those co-equal branches of government, where the executive doesn't have so much power that the legislature can't put a check on it. That makes sense to me. Um, and I know we're going to be talking a lot more about that in the days and weeks to come, but thank you for teasing out some of the examples of what other states are doing. For now, sure, sure. I think we'll just get the popcorn and sit back and wait to see what plays out but I really appreciate everything you've done to make sense of this for parents, kids, interested bystanders across the state, especially me. So thank you so much, Miley. Of course. It was great talking with you. It's great talking with you too.